My name is Laura Boosinger and I began listening to old time music when I was a teenager on reissues of old 78s. And now I make a living playing banjo in and around my home state of North Carolina. If you're a banjo player in North Carolina, then you've heard of Charlie Poole. He was a lint head. Born in Alamance County, he worked in the textile mills that sprouted up in the South in the early 1900s. It was hard, hot, back-breaking work where the only relief was perhaps a little music or whiskey at the end of a long day. He was a gifted musician, maybe a genius, but couldn't read or write. Instead, he busked, playing for pocket money as he rambled around the country. Columbia Records discovered Charlie Poole and his band, the North Carolina Ramblers, and they became an overnight sensation, selling thousands of records. Then, he drifted back into obscurity, back into the mills. Charlie rambled. He rambled from jobs in the mills, from town to town, even from friend and family. What was he searching for? So I decided to do a little rambling myself to find out more about Charlie Cleveland Poole. No one knows more about Charlie Poole than Kenny Rohrer. Kenny's great uncle, Posey Rohrer, played in Charlie's band, the North Carolina Ramblers. So Kenny's house was my first stop. Hey, Kenny, it's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Kenny and musician Kirk Sutphin showed me how Charlie's three-finger style evolved. And, uh, as a young man, he played baseball, and one day he was uh, drinking, of course, with some guys, and he bet a guy 50 cents that the guy could throw a baseball as hard as he could, and Charlie could catch it with his open hand. Well, the bet was made, the ball was thrown, Charlie closed his hand too quick, and the ball broke his fingers, all of his fingers across the front, and when his fingers heal back, they heal back crooked, kind of in a natural picking position. That's one of the things that helped him and probably made his distinctive style. Kirk can duplicate the Charlie Poole style of playing banjo. Charlie Poole style banjo. I want you to hear what Charlie Poole sounded like the way his listeners would have heard him play, and that was on a Victrola. And this is a 1926 Victor Credenza, and this Beautiful. is a recording he made in September of 1926. Wow. This came out in October of 26. And we're going to listen to he and Posey Roar and Roy Harvey do the White House Blues, mm -hmm. the story of the assassination of President William McKinley in 1901. Any, any bluegrass musician worth his salt knows White House blues, but they know, may not know where it came from, and that's where it came from. Uh, Charlie married my dad's aunt, this is her right here, Luemma uh -huh. Rohr, and of course it was her brother, Posey Rohr, who was a fiddler. And then Charlie's wife, a widow, came to live with us when I was in high school, and she would get me to play her husband's records on my dad's old Victrola for her and she'd take a kitchen chair and I'd set it in front of the Victrola. She'd tell me what records mm. she wanted to hear and the one she had almost always asked for was one called Down Among the Budded Roses. And in that song he sings, uh, Darling, Meet Me Up in Heaven. That's my true and earnest prayer. If you love me here on earth, dear, I'm sure you'll love me there. Well, she's listening to a record with her husband singing that and her brother playing the fiddle. And of course, the tears would just flow down her cheek. And for the first time, I understood that this was more than just music. It meant something about those people's lives. It connected them to the past. Connecting to the past. Every June, the town of Eden holds a gathering. 
It's called the Charlie Poole Festival and it brings fans of Charlie's style of music to this park that sits in the shadows of the mill where Charlie last worked. The mill is still standing and it was here where I met Louise Price. Laura, these are the mills where Charlie Poole worked back in the 1920s. They're amazing architecturally. Aren't they gorgeous? They're just beautiful. What do you do with a beautiful old building like this? Well, um, what we think should happen with this particular mill is our group, Piedmont Folk Legacies, is working to establish something called the National Banjo Center. This state in particular is of such tremendous importance for the banjo from Absolutely. Charlie Poole to Earl Scruggs, uh, everybody in between. Um, we've had a big impact. On right here in Spray, North Carolina, what a great legacy for Charlie Poole. Exactly. Kenny stopped by the mill too. He's in town for the festival. Inside this mill, it would reach 120 degrees. And of course, you had all the machinery running, so you had an enormous amount of noise. You had 100 looms running with shuttles, banging back and forth and back and forth. And of course, you can imagine all the lint flying in the air. And of course, in the hot working conditions, you perspire an inordinate amount and you'd imagine all that lint sticks to you, so you come out. That's why these people would have been called lint heads. Uh, I have my great-grandfather's pay envelope from 1920. He worked in this very mill, the Nantucket Mill. His wage uh, for two weeks' work was $21. I also have seen the ledger for Charlie Poole's wages when he worked in the mill here. The last full week he worked, he made $8.20. So you got a choice. Work here in the mill in those conditions with the noise and the lint, or play your banjo. Charlie Poole chose the banjo. Back in the spring of 31, he got a, a contract from a movie company in Hollywood. They sent him the train tickets. They wanted him to come to Hollywood, California, bring his band with him, and play for background in a movie. And he had a big wash tub out on the back porch of their house, in their mill house, and he had it full of homebrew. And Daddy said he was drinking it with a dipper. And Daddy said, he told Charlie, said, uh, Uncle Charlie said, you know, you got to go to California here in a few weeks. You need to straighten up. And Daddy said, Charlie said, don't worry about me, sonny boy. I'll be ready when the time comes. And Daddy said, in a matter of days, he was dead at age 39. And he missed his chance. Charlie Poole's grave is in a quiet cemetery on the edge of town. Maybe too quiet for a guy like Charlie. But he rests here in the shade beside his faithful wife, rambling no more. Take me back to the place where I first saw the light. To the sweet sunny south, take me home. Where the mockingbirds sing me to sleep in the night. Oh, why was I tempted to roam?